All right, folks, welcome back. I am finally out of prison. I'm so glad to be home, but we have fallen so far behind while I was gone. I don't even know where to start. I guess technically I'm a prohibited person now, but like I don't think law enforcement and the justice system really pays much attention to that. So F the police, F the DA, let's get back on the range. And I wanna start with something I've talked about for years, but I've never made a video on, and that's 257 Roberts. My deer season starts eight days from now, so I figure I might as well get an early start on getting my load ready. And I'm going to hunt with 257 Roberts this year. Now, I guess I should admit that I haven't, I haven't actually been in prison. And I'm not, I'm not a prohibited person. So, okay, where have I been if I haven't been in prison? Well, I just haven't been shooting at all. Until about two weeks ago, the last time I shot a rifle was last hunting season. So pretty much a year where I didn't shoot at all and I was doing a little bit of shotgun stuff. And the, the last video I tried to make was a turkey video last spring. And I, I worked up and tested a load and filmed a bunch of stuff for a video. And at some point I'll get around to that subject again and talk about the load. The load I worked up was pretty cool. At least I thought so. It shot pretty good. It's kind of a duplex load with some tungsten and some lead. And it did pretty good. But I didn't, like I had a terrible turkey season. I scouted a whole bunch of new areas and that was good. But for the most part, it was just walking around in the rain and I didn't really even have any good opportunities or exciting stuff to share. So I just had no motivation to finish that video. And then I realized that I really didn't have any motivation to shoot and I had no motivation to make videos. So I just didn't for a while. And I'm still not sure that I do. This, like I've got, I've got a, a handful of videos that I wanna make that I'm kinda of pretty excited to make, including this one today. But this might be something of a farewell tour. Like I, I might be done with YouTube. It's just a much different place than it was back in the day and my motivation's pretty much gone. But who knows, we'll see how it goes. Like I said, I've got four or five videos I definitely wanna make here in the short term and you know, we'll, see, we'll see how it goes. Man, the video editing is the part I'm not looking forward to because I canceled my subscription to the, to the editing software that I normally use. So I need to switch to something else and that's a nightmare. So we'll see how it goes. Maybe, maybe I'll figure out how to, how to put together a video. So like I mentioned, today is 257 Roberts and the gun we're loading for is pretty interesting. It's also a little bit shocking. So especially you Milsert people, like viewer discretion is advised. This is an Arasaka Type 30 carbine that was Bubba uh, sporterized and rechambered to 257 Roberts sometime in the 1950s or 1960s. My grandfather bought it in its current condition. He, he's not to blame for this one, so don't go casting aspersions on my ancestors. He, he bought it out of the local newspaper classifieds. I think it was in the late 60s. And then about 20 years later in the late 80s, he gave it to me and my brother to share for deer hunting when we were little kids. I actually used this gun to get my second deer ever. And it's particularly memorable because it was the first one where I was by myself. It must have been about 12 or something like that. But, but being on my own and having to, you know, gut the deer and drag the deer out of the woods and all that stuff on my own. It's one of my most kind of vivid early hunting memories. Like I, I could, I could, I think I could find that tree I was sitting at if you took me back to that farm. So I'm excited to hunt with it this year. I haven't shot this gun in at least 10 years because I found a big crack in the bolt or in a piece in the bolt. It's actually part of the safety mechanism, but it's a, it's a big ugly crack and I didn't know if the gun was safe to shoot anymore. And I've, I've looked multiple times over the years at the, you know, the websites and stuff that sell old gun parts and could never find what I was looking for. But just a couple days ago, I found the part I need and it's in the mail. Today's Thursday, it's supposed to be here on Saturday. So later in the video, we should be able to fix that bolt. And the way that bolt comes apart is pretty crazy. So I'll show you that later. But I think the, the gun is still safe to shoot, but if that breaks off, off, might end up in a situation where I can't get the bolt open or, you know, it's going to be hard to get the round out. It'll all make sense later when we look at it. But part of the problem was like these, the Arasaka Type 30 is, I guess, already less common than the later versions, but this was the Type 30 carbine. C and Arsenal has an amazing video about the Type 30. They, they've got a regular Type 30 and a carbine and they shoot them both and they've got animations of the action and obviously they go through all of the history. So if you wanna know more about what this gun was originally, that's definitely the video to watch. I'll be sure to link it. So the, Bubba, uh, the sporterizing job 
on this guy is not exactly pretty. It's the original stock, but I guess they cut down shorter and completely reshaped the fore end. The front part of the bottom metal is particularly, particularly janky looking, and the shaping work they did on the butt pad looks like it was chewed by squirrels. But the red filled peep sight that they put on the back is pretty nice, and it's, you know, they're, they're very comfortable sights to look through. I pulled the stock off to clean it, and I had never noticed it before, but there's actually Remington markings on the bottom of the barrel. I don't know how that would have worked. I don't know if, you know, I know sporterizing surplus rifles was extremely popular back then, or maybe Remington sold chambered barrels that the gunsmith would then thread and set up for the action. I don't know. The stocks on these are really neat because apparently the Japanese didn't have access to the to the same hardwoods as other makers, so they made the stocks two pieces and switched the grain direction to make the toe more durable. And behind the trigger guard and you know kind of the main action, there's these metal reinforcements. So it's kind of got this big long tang. I don't know if that'd be called a tang. Apparently all of that was was due to the stocks being prone to uh, to crack in their earlier versions, I guess. But it's a neat little gun. It's pretty light. It's very, very comfortable. Like the balance is amazing. So it's nice to shoot offhand. I already mentioned that peep sight is nice to look through. So it's not a very good example of an Arasaka Type 30 carbine anymore. But I guess it's a bit of a time capsule into the mid-century shooting hobby and what guys were doing with the massive amount of surplus that was hitting the market after World War II. So enough about the gun for now. Let's get into loading some ammo. Okay, so it's the following day stopped and edited the intro to this video to see if I could figure out my editing software concerns. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. And our bolt part, I've been keeping a close eye on the tracking info for it. It looks like it's definitely going to show up tomorrow. So I think I'll wait on that before we do any shooting. So the loading part here, I'm hoping it's going to be pretty straightforward. If, you're, if you've never seen a 257 Roberts, here it is lined up with a 308 and a 30-06. A little bit skinnier, a little bit longer than the 308. Quite a bit of taper on the cases. I'm thinking with that taper, these things should be pretty easy to resize. I've got three different types of brass. I've got 20 pieces of brand new uh, Remington RP head stamped brass. I've got some Remington UMC that's older and been reloaded before, but it seems to be in good shape. And I've got some WW Super head stamps as well. In total, I think I've got like 70 something pieces of brass. Now, one thing I'll mention is that all of these are the, are standard 257 Roberts head stamps. There's also a 257 Roberts plus P. The best description I found for that situation was in the Spear manual. And you'll see their section is actually labeled plus P. And actually it says right here, 1988 was when the plus P variant came about. And it looks like they went from 54,000 PSI to 58,000 PSI or 45,000 CUP to 50,000 CUP. They say to load non plus P ammunition for older rifles, reduce maximum powder charges by at least two grains. Now over in the Hornady manual, they say that their data is for plus P, plus P pressure in plus P cases, and it should only be used for modern firearms. Yeah, the note that made me a little bit nervous was some cases currently produced are designed for plus P pressures in the 257 Roberts and have slightly less powder capacity. Segregate your brass by brand and develop loads accordingly. So I took the three different types of brass that I've got and did case capacity measurements. Uh, you, you weigh them empty and then fill them full of water and weigh them again, see how much water they hold. The RP head stamp and the, the Remington UMC head stamp both held just over 45 grains of water and the WW Super held about 45.5. So that seems awfully close. I think we're good to go. You know, should be able to have one load for all three types of brass. And we'll see if there's uh, a bit of velocity drop in the Winchester because that capacity is a little bit higher. It shouldn't matter. But I just, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, none of them had something drastically different. So I've got two different bullets that I think would be perfect for this job. First is a Sierra Game King. That's a 90 grain hollow point boat tail. This one makes me a little bit nervous because I looked up this bullet on the Sierra website and the description says it will perform as a varmint bullet at high velocities, but it may also be used on medium game from smaller capacity cartridges such as the 250 3000 Savage and 257 Roberts. I'm not looking to load anything hot, obviously, for this old gun. So I think, you know, velocities should be low enough to where this bullet will hold together and work for deer, but that made me just a little bit nervous and 90 grains is just a little bit lighter than the second option, which is 100 grains. 
This is a Sierra Pro Hunter that is a flat base. I think they should be perfect. The only thing that makes me a little bit nervous about the flat base bullets, see if I can find, yeah, here we go. So some of this brass was loaded and I didn't have any documentation about what was in it. So a lot of this, I pulled the bullets and dumped the powder so we could start over from scratch. But you see how there's, this kind of looks a little bit bulgy where the previous bullet was, was seated. I'm afraid that might mean that our sizing die has got a small expander ball and we've got a little bit smaller neck than we you know, strictly need. And it might make seating these flat base bullets a pain in the butt. And unfortunately, I, I don't shoot anything else in 25 caliber, so I don't have the neck sizing tools that I you know, would have for, for other cartridges to adjust neck tension just where I wanted it. So we'll see how seating goes. If it's a huge pain in the butt, we'll probably switch over to the boat tail bullets just to make life easier. We'll see how things go. Now the load data from the Sierra manual for this uh, 100 grain, yeah, the guy on top right there, the 1620, that's what we're shooting. It's got a nice selection of powders. And I think I'm gonna use H4350. They show a big, huge, wide range of acceptable charge weights, you know, all the way down to 36.1 grains up to 44.1. And down here, they even call out 42.5 grains as the recommended accuracy load. On the Hodgson website, I think it was a spear bullet, but it was with a 100 grain bullet, they show 43 to 45 grains. The spear manual shows 43 to 47. So this 42.5 is actually below the starting charge in the spear and Hodgson data. So I'm thinking this might be a good one, good one to go with. Maybe we'll do 42.0, just to, just to make sure. There's no, reason to, there's no reason to get crazy. This gun has open sights. I am absolutely not gonna be taking any shots over 100 yards really don't need the extra velocity and we might as well be easy on our brass because this brass is hard to find i think it's like a lot of these things you know it, it hits the market every few years and people buy what they need i guess there is some factory ammo out there and available and i had bought this stuff i can't remember exactly when but the package had 2012 on it i think it was yeah so the, the box art and stuff's from 2012 so it had to be after then and the only reason i bought it was for the brass so this is an empty box. I went ahead and pulled the bullets, dumped the powder, and that's how we've got 20 pieces of brand new brass. So you can see back here, we've got plenty of H4350 powder. I'm gonna use Winchester WLR primers. The die set I've got is a standard two die set from Redding with a full length sizing die. Yeah, there it is, full length sizing die and a standard seating die. Actually, I'll tell you what, while I've got this out, I wanna measure this expander and see about where it's at. It's 255, which is exactly what I would expect. You know, it's two thousandths under the bullet diameter. So hopefully that'll be good. These dies are pretty greasy. I better, better clean them before we use them. So let's see, is that it? I was looking at overall length a little bit ago. So this is at about 2.775, which is what the, the manual says. And that puts the base of the bullet down below the, uh, you know, the junction of the shoulder. So we could, we could stretch this out quite a bit if we wanted to. I was looking at the max overall length the other day, and I guess I didn't write it down, so pull this out so it's barely seated. I'll grab the gun real quick. If I'm remembering correctly, it was coming out right about three inches. So let's just push this in and let the rifling seat that bullet. And see what that is. 3.018, yep, it was right at three inches. I want to see what the number is if I bring the base of the bullet like right down to the neck shoulder junction. Yeah, maybe about right there. Let's see what that 2.870. There's a ton of room inside the magazine. So I don't think that's a concern. We can go longer if we want to. Yeah, let's do that. We'll shoot for 2.860 and that'll put us right about there. Let me write that down. Now, why would I do that instead of just shooting it at the recommended 2.775 inches? I don't really have a good answer for you, to be honest with you. Now, if this was a precision rifle, I would say that reducing our, our bullet jump to the rifling down to, see, I guess this would be about 150 thousandths. Like that would probably promote better accuracy, very generally speaking. And it, you know, this situation, the limiting factor, factor in accuracy is my ability to see these open sights. So it probably doesn't matter, just a habit, I guess. 
but we'll go with this anyway. All right, let's see, we need to size some brass. So you might have noticed a little bit of confusion in my voice whenever I realized these dies were, were covered in grease and stuff. Like these are brand new dies. I think I bought them about 10 years ago, around the same time I bought that back box of factory ammo and then realized that the bolt had that big crack in it. So I went into my piles of my grandpa's old crap and found this. This is an old RCBS 257 Roberts sizing die and it's missing the expander. I also found this old Hollywood die, 257 crimp seat die, Hollywood gun shop. So my best guess are those rounds with the, with the janky necks. My grandfather had sized that brass with this die that didn't have an expander and was like, screw it, I guess the bullet's the expander and that's why they, yeah, they had way, way, way too much neck tension. So I'm feeling a whole lot better about things. I'm gonna get this brand new die set cleaned up with its perfectly sized expander and hopefully we won't have any problems whatsoever. I think out of all of the cases I've ever stuck in my life, at least half of them were in brand new Redding dies. They can be a bit sticky until you get them broken in, it seems like to me. So our shell holder is gonna be the same as for a 308. And I wanna start with this, with the Remington, with the RP brass, since it's never been fired. The body shouldn't be getting you know, sized much at all. We're really just wanting to resize the neck. So I, I pulled out, I was going to do like a small batch and then, you know, we'll see how it goes and then I'll do the rest later. But I've talked myself into doing them all. So I've got all of my brass lubed up. Whoa, oh, that was a speck of dirt or a little, little piece of brass. I looked down and saw that and thought it was a, a split neck, but it's just a little, little piece of brass, whatever. So I've got all my brass lubed up. I just used some Hornady one shot, made sure to get the inside of the necks really good. And I think I'm gonna set up the die and just size everything. And the main reason is because I'm not planning to shoot this gun a lot. So this ammo that I load up, it might be, you know, 20 years before it gets fired. So even though, you know, some of the stuff like Hornady one shot, it says it won't contaminate powder and you don't have to worry about cleaning it off. For ammo that I know might be a long-term deal, like. I would rather go ahead and put this stuff back in the tumbler, make sure all the lube is cleaned off and dry them off in the dehydrator before we go dumping any powder. So that's the plan. So I want to look, I wanna make sure I'm not bumping the shoulder on these. Like, like I said, this is unfired brass and they're reading about 1.792 on, uh, on the comparator here. I don't even know if this is the right comparator. It's a 375 and it's, Looks like it's hitting the shoulder in about the right spot. So I screwed the sizing die down until it's just, it's making pretty light contact with the shell holder. So let's see what this first one does. Up in there, very, very little resistance. And back out. It's reading 1.790 now. I'm gonna go ahead and back it out just a little bit. Try the next one. This factory ammo, it had pretty, pretty deep crimps. So right there around the case mouth, it's taking a little bit of effort to get it up over that expander, expander on the way up. And just wanna make sure I'm not gonna screw up those case mouths. So taking it kind of slow. Okay, 1.791. So it might be kissing that shoulder just a little bit. Here's the next piece before sizing, 1.791. And after is about the same. So good, I think, it's, I think it's right at the shoulder. Let me see if I can find one of the other head stamps. Here's the, the WW Super head stamp. It's currently at 1.793. I can tell by the by the neck on this one that it was, you know, it's one of the ones that was still loaded that I pulled a bullet out of. It's got that bulge. So let's see how it does. So the headspace number afterwards looks about the same as, as the Remington's were and our bulgy neck 
you can tell it's kind of shiny I'm not sure if that'll come across on camera but that's where all the work happened it looked like so that looks good Let's see if I can find one that I think's been fired yeah here's the the UMC brass I think this was a fired piece 1.797 Very smooth going in and out. Came out 1.792. I guess before I go further, I want to take all of these. I want to take these sized pieces and make sure they chamber in the gun smoothly. Okay, all of those fed like butter. So I think I'm going to roll with this die setting. This is one of the things I hate about reading dies. This is what the expander looks like. And there's really no, like a lot of other dies, I'll grab one here in just a second and show you. A lot of the others have a, a tapered portion to where, you know, if you've got a janky neck that needs ironed out, it's got a little smoother way to do it. These are, uh, it's just, it's, it's a pretty severe all or nothing sort of situation. It's a pain in the butt. See, here's one from a Hornady die. Nice taper on it. No matter how jacked up your case mouth is, it's going, to, it's going to be able to straighten it out. So that's what I'm talking about, and that's what I'm trying to be careful about. Okay, that was completely trouble free. I love it when that happens. So next I wanna go ahead and measure the length on a bunch of these, see if we need to do some trimming. So our maximum length is 2.233 and our trim length is 2.223. Most of these so far are coming out right at the trim length or a little bit short. And like here's a 2.222. So out of that whole batch, I only found six pieces that need a few thousands trimmed off. None of them are even over the max length. They're just a little bit longer than the others, which are already right about the perfect trim length. So I pulled out the Trim Pro, and this should only take a couple of minutes. Okay, I'm gonna go tumble these in some hot soapy water for a few minutes, and then give them a couple hours in the dehydrator, and we'll be ready to move forward. So brass prep is done, and I've moved on to installing our primers. I'm just gonna go ahead and prime all 73 pieces of brass that I've got. And hopefully things will move quickly from this point forward. Okay, so we're ready to weigh out some charges and get to seat and bullets. I was revisiting my load data and thinking about it some more. I think I'm gonna drop down a little bit more. These, these first two loads, I wanna load five shots at 41.0 grains and five shots at 41.5. And just see where we're at as far as velocity goes. Because at least the Sierra load data is done with a 22 inch barrel. And I think the barrel on this, I, I've measured from you know the bolt face to the end of the barrel is 21 and a half. So it's not much shorter. And 41 grains should get us about 2,800 feet per second. I think that's plenty of velocity to, you know, to expand these Pro Hunter bullets, you know, out to the ranges I'm wanting to shoot. So we'll start there and give that a try. So I'm going to do, yeah, five shots at 41 and five shots at 41.5. Got the old RCBS Charge Master light out here, and it's all warmed up. Make sure the drain's closed. It was open. I was about to dump powder all over the all over the bench. It wouldn't have been the first time. I'm gonna grab a couple check weights and test the scale. There's 20. Looks good. And there's 40. Perfect. 
So 41.0, go. Looks like our powder level's about maybe right here. Focus, there we go. So quite a bit of case capacity left. I'm kind of surprised by that because I think it was the spear manual that goes up to 47.0 and it, it showed that as being a compressed, a compressed load. Okay, this is the moment of truth, I guess. Let's see if we can get this seating die set up. I'm going to put a case in there and then screw the die down until I feel the crimp touch. There it is right there. I'll back off of that about a turn and lock down the die body. We don't want to do any crimp. I was looking earlier whenever I was cleaning this, looking at the, the fit for the bullet and it feels really nice. Like the, the profile of the seating stem fits the profile of the, of the bullet nicely it seems. So that's always nice. Our overall length target is 2.8 eight six zero okay felt like it seated a little bit definitely still too long it started really nicely right at 2.9 right now so down about 40 more thousandths which if I'm not mistaken each turn of this thread pitch is about 40 thousandths I'll go half a turn and see if it See if that's about 20. 2.884, so yeah, that was around 20. That is just about perfect. 2.859, 2.858, close enough. Especially with these soft point bullets, you'll have some variation in length anyway. Try this next one. Yeah, those are starting really nicely. Yeah, this one's a bit short, 2.851, which this is fine. You know, we made up the overall length number anyway. But you might notice the tip on this one's pretty flat. Yeah, these are seating like butter. They feel great. 2.857. Two point eight five six. Could go ahead and measure the the neck tension. So the diameter right now before we've seated a bullet is point two eight two. And after is point two eight four. So two thousandths. That is good. That is really good. Like I mentioned, they're seating super duper smooth, but you know, there's enough resistance there where it feels like we've got sufficient neck tension. Sometimes they go in a little bit too easy and it makes you kind of worried. So it's definitely not that, it's feeling perfect. It looks like they're all just a little bit short and the ones with particularly boogered up tips are a bit shorter, but I've got like three or four of them that are two point 858, which is 2,000 shorter than our target. Perfectly good enough for me. There's one that's 2.860. So I'm very, very happy with that. So our ammo is ready for the range. We just need a bolt that's repaired. And I guess we could go ahead and tear that bolt apart tonight. Because the part's getting delivered to my PO box, so I should be able to go pick it up first thing in the morning. So might as well get as much preparation done tonight as we can. This bolt isn't too bad to take apart, but you, yeah, back here, things get a little bit weird and you gotta know the order of operations. The head just turns 90 and then pulls out. And this comes off like that, and then that pops off. So there's those. And then in the back, we start unscrewing this thing Actually, I think I need to move this over to there. 
And then once this is out so far, you'll stop making progress. And it's kind of confusing as to why it won't keep uh, unscrewing. And once it starts popping like that, jumping threads, what you have to do is compress the, uh, the firing pin end. And the body from a pin seems to work pretty well. Just kind of push the whole thing. And it'll start lifting off like that. And then what happens is this thing splits. It's actually two pieces. And then you're done. Did you catch that? So what's actually going on in there is inside of that this split bolt is a groove where the, the firing pin lays like that. Thank God for YouTube. I never would have gotten this thing apart without some tutorial videos. So our bad part this guy right here, you just drop it out the side like that. And there's a better look at our crack. Have a look at my crack. So the back part with the hook on it, that's what these two made up. And that's how you move the, uh, you know, the safety. And this is where your trigger sear sits. And that crack is alarmingly close to that. So hopefully the part that comes in is a perfect match. I think it should be. And I guess what I should probably do tonight is throw all of this stuff in the ultrasonic. While I've got it apart, might as well. Yep, might as well. Okay, that's it for tonight. I'll see you guys after I've got the part in my hand. All right, folks, I think we're in business. Does it look like the same part? Here's what I, I never realized. This was actually broken worse than I thought. I think the overhead view here is where it's most obvious. Yeah, there's a big old chunk that has been missing. That's opposite. See, that's where it's broken. And then the other side is where the big crack is. So this piece was even more jank than I thought it was. Everything looks the same. Well, you can def definitely tell where the trigger rides. Mine's got a whole lot more wear on it. This one's nice and sharp, looks almost new. Yeah, there's the new one looking all nice and sharp and mine is not quite so sharp. Awesome. Tell you what, shout out to this place I bought this from is cfnparts.com. The price was reasonable, it was like twenty $22.50. I ordered it in the morning and they had it in the mail on that same day. So really good stuff. Uh, at another, I think it was another site, I had found an entire like bolt assembly with everything except the, except the bolt head that was like 150 bucks. I thought that's what I was gonna have to do, but 22 bucks is a lot better than 150. So I feel happy to have it. All right, let's get this thing. Let's make sure this, yeah, there's the two pieces. fitted together, looking good. All right, let's get it reassembled. Actually, I'm gonna grease this stuff up a little bit before I put it all together. All right, everything's got a light coating of grease, like your greasy grandma. And assembly should be pretty straightforward. Our two, let's see, these pieces that go on the bolt head, the extractor, and then this other thingy, which I think goes that way. Okay, that part's ready. And our new part, and our new part drops in here like that. And there's that. Got that rotated incorrectly. There it goes. Spring on that guy. And then I guess we need to compress it again. That last pin I used wasn't quite, now my hands are covered in grease and I gotta get this out of here. I need pliers. There we go. And let's see if I can manage to compress this down and then get, drop it on the floor. And this is some outstanding camera work right here. And drop it. Okay. And we 
this should start threading in. Yeah, what was I thinking? Covering everything in grease? I mean, you gotta you gotta lube it before it goes back together, right? I guess I could use a, a you can use a screwdriver or a coin, I guess. Let me see if I got a gigantic screwdriver. Here we go. Screwdriver's too big. Let's try this one. Okay, I think that's good. Let's see if this works. How about that? Looking good. Let's see if I can get the orientation of this bolt head correct. All right, I think we're good. Assuming I've got this oriented correctly, I might have to, it might be that way. I don't know. Let's go shoot it. Okay, so I'm all set up and ready to shoot. Got the lab radar to get some velocities. I've got a target at 50 yards. One thing I've definitely noticed just playing around here, the trigger is much heavier than it was with the old part. It still feels pretty good. But just quite a bit heavier. And I forgot to hit record on the target camera. Stand by. Okay, first shot, 41.0 grains. Let's see what happens. Okay, velocity very low, 25.47, that's a good thing. Recoil was really light, the bolt just opened nice and easy. The brass looks good. Did we hit the target? Okay, just a little bit high. We'll load the other four rounds of the 41.0 grains into the magazine, make sure it's going to feed okay. Let's shoot a few more. Okay, that's not exactly the prettiest group I've ever seen. And I don't remember the gun shooting that high in the past. Unfortunately, the rear sight is as low as it can go. So we might be out of luck. Tell you what, let's go ahead and shoot five more of the, the 41.5 grain loads. And then we'll move the target to 100 and see where our, where our groups are hitting. Okay, 41.5. First one's 26.56. I switched to kind of like a six o'clock hold, put my front side post right below the red for one to separate the groups and that should put us pretty close. Looks like it's, looks like it's pretty close. Okay, so that, that hold brought us down just about perfect. That, that's a two inch circle at 50 yards. So it's not the best group I've ever shot, but it's certainly good enough to deer hunt with. All the brass looks really good and our velocities, I'll calculate the averages and put them on the screen for you, but I don't know what they are. I just have the individual numbers. It looks like we were about 2560-ish and about 100 feet per second faster with the next, with the 41.5 grain load. So what I want to do is I'm going to run inside and load a couple more. I feel like we should have, you know, we've got room to move up a little bit. I wouldn't mind a little bit more velocity. So I think I'm going to load what I originally was going to load, 42.0 grains. So I'm going to load some 42.0. I'm going to do it with, well, I'll do, I'll do some shots in all three different types of brass. And we'll compare the velocities. So that'll only take a couple minutes. I'm going to leave all my crap out here. No need to film it. And I think we'll move the target to 100 yards. We'll see where it's printing at 100. Okay, so I've loaded up three shots with each of our three types of brass. 
at 42.0 grains. We'll start out with the same RP head stamps that we've been shooting to see what our velocity looks like. I'm assuming somewhere right around 2750. Let's find out. First velocity was 2691. Okay, that is even higher. It's probably outside of where I've got my camera pointed. So it's straight high, about two rings outside of the black. Hmm, okay. I'll just hold low this time. Twenty-seven forty. Figured that's about where we would be. That's still really high. Huh? What can I do? I think either modifying the front sight post to be taller, or finding another a taller front sight post is really the only reasonable option. Neither of which is going to happen today. I guess the least I could do is go move the camera so you guys can actually see where these hot shots are going. And then that one's down in the black. That's weird. Somehow that second shot, I guess I just wasn't aiming as low as I thought I was. Okay, next brass, this is the Remington UMC brass. So, on the lookout for unexpected high velocity here. 2742, which was exactly the same as the, as the last shot with the other brass. Good. So that was good and that was you know what we were expecting out of the out of the Remington UMC brass because the case capacity measurement was the same. Those next three shots are with the Winchester brass and it has a little bit more case capacity so I expect that the velocities will be a little bit lower. Shouldn't be too much I don't think. Oh that is a bit higher. 2781. That's our highest velocity so far by almost 40 feet per second. Interesting. I'm still feeling okay about that. I mean, I think I think that's fine. The brass looks good. Nothing weird going on with it. Okay, so very successful on the reloading front. I just need to think if I need to think through this uh, sight situation. I'm trying to think if there's anything I can do quickly. Let's get back to the bench. So apparently my target camera wasn't recording, which is just wonderful. But I got to thinking. So remember the Remington markings on this barrel? Like surely Remington uses the same size, you know, dovetail in all of their sights. And I think the front sight is Remington. So I went through all of the Remington guns I've got and found this one on the front of a 243 that hasn't had a, rear, a set of rear sights like ever. So this is an utterly useless front sight and it is definitely a little bit taller. So my, I think it's gonna fit. And I think it's going to be just about perfect. So I drifted the old one out of the 257 Roberts and I'm about to see if this one will go in and fit halfway decent. Looks good so far. I've got windage adjustment on the back, so I don't need to freak out about centering it too much. I think that's about perfect. It went in there really nice and tight. It's a little bit goofy looking, but I couldn't care less. See how it looks through the, through the peep. Looks good. Looks real good. Sweet. Let's go shoot some more. Maybe I can remember to turn the target camera on. I need to load some more ammo though. So I went ahead and weighed charges and seated bullets for 15 more shots. So we should have plenty here to try and get zeroed. I've got a fresh target at 100 yards. I made sure the camera's recording. Let's see where it's at. Looks like two o'clock, just barely in the black. I've got the sun hitting my peep sight right now. Let's see if I can come up with a way to block that sun. Try this again. Okay, that's better. That's two shots that are a little bit to the right. 
Just gave the rear sight five clicks. See what that does. It's low in the black. Who knows, man? My eyesight sucks. At least they're going in the black. Let's shoot several, see if we can get something grouping. Okay, so all of them are in the black. I feel like that's all I could ask for. If anything, it's shooting just a touch low. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Tell you what, I got five more shots left. I want to shoot those at 50 yards. So let me move the target camera. And hopefully I can aim a little bit more precisely at 50. This front side post kind of sucks. Like the, the bead is bigger than the last one. And it's a lot bigger than the black circle down there. And I was having, having a hard time getting a, a really tight hold. All right, let's move to 50. Okay, five shots left. Target's at 50. I took a couple of those clicks that I had given it left. I put it back to the right a couple clicks. So let's see where we're at. Still a little bit left. I'm gonna go two more clicks right. I think that puts us back where we originally were. Or maybe I'm still one click left of where I was. Pretty darn close. Very happy about this. All right. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That should get the job done. I did come up a couple clicks, just like two clicks on the rear sight before I shot this 50 yard group. And I could go one or two more, but I'm not gonna worry about it. A half inch low at 50 yards is perfectly good enough and that should put us just about right at 100 I think so yep we're good feeling a whole lot better now after switching this front side post let's get back to the bench all right folks this is a little bit embarrassing have a look at that split neck I didn't even notice it this is one of the one of the Remington UMC head stamps and I just wasn't looking close enough out on the range when I'm inspecting I'm usually looking for case head problems and then case head separations, right? You'll start seeing lines right around here that show case head separations, and that's a pretty catastrophic failure. Usually a neck split's, you know, not, not a huge deal. So I overlooked it. So then I started looking closer, and there's another one. Also Remington UMC, and there's another one. I'm gonna have to start taking my reading glasses out on the range with me so I can be a little bit more thorough in my inspections. There, is that it? Yep, that's the one. Because, you know, once you've got three failures like that, it's time to start having a really close look. If you take a flashlight and start spinning them, you'll start picking up cracks that are a lot less obvious. I only had like 17 pieces of that UMC brass. I found cracks on eight of them. There's a little guy right there. Needed the flashlight to pick it up. Looks like just a pinhole. Actually, there it is. Just a little pinhole right there. Here's another pretty big one that, that's kind of hard to see. There it is. Here's another one that's really hard to spot. So you get the point. And so all of the Remington UMC brass, I'm gonna throw it away. It's clearly in bad shape. So the WW Super stuff, I ended up finding a couple on these as well. There we go, this one's got two side by side right there. So I found six. I don't think any of the ones on here, well, yeah, this one's pretty obvious. There it is. All these Winchesters seem to have the, the double splits. And I was looking in the action, like the magazine and the, the feeding ramps and stuff in the gun. I don't see anywhere that would cause gouging or anything that would promote cracks like this. Little bit of a mystery. This one's got two that really aren't that close together. There's one and then there's another. Pretty tough to spot. So in all, I found 14 cases with, with split necks. So all of the UMC brass is in the trash. And I went ahead and loaded up the 20 new pieces of RP and the 30 remaining WW Supers. So I think these 30 old cases, after I shoot them again, I'm just gonna throw it in the trash. And I'm not gonna worry about getting more brass right now because you know if I've got the gun zeroed 
and I'm shooting it quite a quite a bit here for this video so like going forward tw 20 pieces should be fine for the foreseeable future it was a little bit frustrating to watch those last 15 or so shots on the range while I was editing the video because I'm like dude move your sight you're shooting low so here in a couple days whenever I'm on the on the range for my next video I'm going to go ahead and shoot some more with this gun and get that zero dialed in exactly where I want it because I'll have the the shot marker electronic target system set up and it'll be a little bit easier to track things but I'm extremely happy to have this gun back in service and ready to go everything just worked out nicely got a re replacement part for a good price I had another front sight laying around that would work it feels really good and I'm, I'm happy with you know the accuracy we were seeing our velocity of 27 25 that should be plenty to expand the 100 grain pro hunter bullet so i expect good performance i've got three deer tags i've already i got one with a muzzle loader a couple weeks ago so i've got three more deer tags and i want to you know i want to use them i want to put a bunch of meat in the freezer this year so here in the next couple videos hopefully i'll be able to give you some feedback on how these bullets performed this entire scenario reminded me of my Swiss K31, which shoots way high. You know, it's, you know, I think those sites only, you know, they only were supposed to go down to 300 meters at the shortest or something like that. So it makes it frustrating to shoot. And the last time I looked for a taller front sight post for that gun, they weren't available. It's like, like there was a guy that sold them, but then he passed away and they weren't available. Well, this experience made me check again and they're out there. I, I ordered one. I've got one in the mail, so I'll probably be having a 7.5 by 55 Swiss video here pretty soon, part of my, my farewell tour. We'll get my K31 sighted in. Like, how cool would that be to have a gun that's actually sighted in? It's a frustrating situation to have a gun you can't zero. So I guess this is a good stopping point for this video. Appreciate you joining me. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm gonna be starting my next video as soon as I finish this one, so. So I guess I'll see you then, and if you're heading out into the deer woods, good luck.